2.6 chain rule, we are on example 1G. 1G. All right, so the chain rule, again, is useful when we're taking the derivative of what type of function? Composite functions, right, which is a function inside of a function. So this is the verb format again. We got the derivative with respect to x of x times secant of x squared plus x plus 1. So I know that it's going to be a what rule out of the box? Product. I have a variable x times the secant of a variable. It's a product rule. But in that second factor, it's not just secant of x. It's secant of blob. So that second factor is going to require the what rule? Chain rule. Okay, sweet. So here we go. The product rule, no rewriting necessary. It all looks good. So I'm going to drop the ddx. The derivative of x is 1 times secant of blob. And then plus x, ooh, x times the derivative of secant of blob. What's the derivative of secant of blob? What's the derivative of secant? No, the derivative of tangent is secant squared, but the derivative of secant is secant x tangent x. So if it's blob, the derivative of secant blob is secant blob tangent blob. Yeah, secant blob, tangent blob. And then times the chain rule, we'll use pink there, the derivative of the blob itself, which is what? Parentheses, 2x plus 1. That's the derivative of x squared minus x plus 1. Notice you generate x squared plus x plus 1 twice. You don't take the derivative of the things that you're, rep of your, that you're generating. You always refer back to the original function. So you're not going to multiply by 2x plus 1 twice because it generated itself twice here. Oops, not like that. You're always referring back to the original. So there's just one inside function. It generates one derivative. Now, common error, common error, alert. What's the common error? That right there. What's wrong with that at the end? What's wrong with it right here? I'm missing what? Yeah, I'm missing parentheses, because without parentheses, it's just like all of that, blah, 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 and then plus one is the last term in this three-term thing. And even if you leave it like that and you recover, because you know it's supposed to be in parentheses, if that's the free response, you think you still lose a check there? Say yes. Yes, you will. So, again, your parentheses are super, super important in this class. They're like your best friends. Right, Nick? It's better to what? It's better to have them. No, no, it's better <laughs> It's better to have them than not need them. Something like that. It's better to have them and then not need them than to need them and not have them. It's better to have them and, okay. All right. Good stuff. Um, if we wanted to do something with this expression, is there anything that we could do? Yeah, I would probably factor out a secant, maybe, from both terms. Um, I guess you could take this whole thing and distribute it inside there if you want to. Typically, we like to factor things because we're going to be setting them equal to zero. Um, I'm not going to go through that right now, but uh, just being aware of some of the opportunities. Okay, we'll shrink that down, and then that doesn't work anymore, so we'll get rid of it. All right, questions on G? Not bad for Columbus Day. All right. Letter H, yes. Question, no. What's the variable? Independent variable. M. Okay, you walk up to the problem, and I see secant of blob. So it starts off as a secant rule. But inside, I have a blob that's not just plain old M, and so this is going to require the chain rule. Now, notice the inside function has two terms. The first term is pretty easy to take the derivative of, right? But that second term, ooh, man, that's a nucleus. It's got some stuff in it. That second term is really how many functions in one? How many layers do you see? You see two? I kind of see more than two. Well, well, not cosine, cosine, cosine. But I see, uh, I see a function cubed. I see a cosine function. And then I see in 5M, which is a linear function. So there's actually three layers there. So what I would do when I see multiple layers is before I take the derivative, I help myself help myself by rewriting it. And uh, it's nice in notability you can use different flavors here. So 
Remember, if you see cosine cubed or sine squared, that's a condensed version. I would recommend that you write it in the expanded version. Okay, so it's blob cubed. And then the blob is cosine of something, and then the innermost blob is 5m. So color coding it, you have 4 minus blob cubed, and then you're going to have cosine of blob and 5m. But that's just in the second term on the inside function. I think we're ready to go now. From the outside in now, the derivative of secant of blob is secant blob tangent blob. Oh, that's going to be fun. Now, I'm going to go ahead and write the blob as the original condensed blob, just because that's, that's the whole purpose of having a condensed. It's easier to write. Secant blob, tangent of the blob. All right. Times. Now I go on the inside. And I multiply by its derivative. Well, that's two terms. What's the derivative of 4? 0. I'm going to go ahead and put 0 there because if that were like a 4m or something, it would generate a, a, a term that's not 0. So the parentheses would be important. Now, the next term is going to be blob cubed. So it's minus blob cubed becomes minus 3 blob squared. Okay, so I'm on the green layer. Minus. Blob cubed becomes 3 blob squared, and I'm just going to write the blob in there, cosine of 5m, times the next layer now, just on that term and that term alone, becomes the derivative of cosine of blob, which is what? Negative sine of blob. And notice I didn't put dot negative. And then finally, the innermost blob is the brown blob. The derivative of 5m with respect to m is 5. And notice the parentheses for the purple would go here. So that term right there, or that last factor, sorry, has two terms. But zero being one of them really condenses it down to a single term. Again, had that four been something that had a variable in it, you would need parentheses around both those terms because then that secant tangent would have to distribute into it. But as it is, we could go ahead and simplify it a little bit. I got a negative 3 times a 5 times a negative 1. So what is that going to equal? Positive 15, right? And because the 0 is gone, I could say that that becomes just another factor. So I could actually pull it out in the front and call it a positive 15. And then I got a cosine squared of 5m times the sine of 5m times all this stuff right here, which I'll just copy and paste. Kind of cheating. And that would be about as cleaned up as we could make it. Now, if you understand that problem right there, you understand the chain rule. Because that one, that one is, is very tedious. And that's really what the chain rule is about, is it's about careful record keeping. You're taking inventory as you're unpacking these boxes like going inside of a like an Egyptian tomb and inside there there's another secret room and inside there there's another secret room and inside there there's another secret room and then of course you hit the booby trap and then you're trapped in that room forever right yeah okay anyway um, any questions on H will you ever see one that nasty or dastardly Probably not. Probably not on the AP exam, but it's good to overtrain, right? Yeah. All right. Letter I. Hmm. Walk up to the problem. What do you see right away? Hello. Do you see hello quotient rule? I'm standing. I'm standing outside. Here's the. Here's the. Here's the walls in that. In that pyramid, and somehow I'm allowed to enter it right here. So now here I stand. That's me, and I have my, of course, my bucket hat on like all those Egyptologists wear. And what do I see? I don't see a quotient rule yet. I just see this monument that looks like blob squared. I'm like, wow, someone built a monument to blob squared. So this would be a what first? I'm going to drop the whole Egyptologist analogy. It's, I, don't see, I don't see the quotient rule yet. I see a blob squared, and it's only when I get to the inside, after I take the derivative of the outer layer, blob squared, do I see that it's a quotient rule. So this is a quotient rule, yes, but it's a chain rule first. Do we need to rewrite any of them? No, it looks good to go. So blob squared becomes two blob to the first. And you can think of that as kind of a, 
the step that allows you then to go into the next chamber after well, I said I'd abandon it. Ah, after you take the drivet to the outside layer. Now I go inside and I'm like, ah, quotient rule. So now it's the what rule? The quotient rule is also known as the Schroeder. Schroeder, take it. The Sir rule. Very good. Where Sir stands for Hody High. Yes. All right, tune in, tune in. So we got Ho. D high is three. Minus high. D ho is 2x. Good. You're not listening to my YouTube videos through your ear, are you? Because if you are, then that's fine. No, okay. All over ho ho. Don't forget the ho squared or ho ho. There it is. So that 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 inside box was I mean, it was pretty packed, right? Because notice that when we unpacked its contents, it looks like it turned into something bigger than what the contents themselves were. So it was maybe like a space bag or something. I don't know. Okay. Now, if we wanted to clean that up, could we? Should we? Will we? Eh, eh. I don't know. I got 2 times 3x minus 1. I can multiply straight across times this wonderful thing of x squared plus 3 times 3. Maybe I'll pull that 3 in front. Minus 2x, I'll pull that in front, 3x minus 1. But that's still all in its own big group right there. And in the bottom, it looks like I can get x squared plus 3 what? Cubed. Okay. So I would I would still need to do something with that inside right there. Maybe distribute it out, factor it out, combine like terms. And again, if we wanted to use this, maybe that's what we do. It's partially factored in the numerator, so you expand it out and try to refactor it. Okay. Um, any questions on I? All right, example two. Find all the values on this graph for which the derivative is zero and for which the derivative doesn't exist. Oh, now we're getting into some applications. Finding where the derivatives are zero is important because that's where the graph has what type of tangent line? Horizontal tangent line. That's kind of nice. And finding out where the derivative fails to exist could be, that's another important place, because that could be a cusp, right? Or it could be a, what? It could be a jump or any type of discontinuity, like a vertical asymptote. Or it could be, what's the other place where, yeah, sharp turn would maybe fall under the, the cusp. Sharp turn, any discontinuities. And there's one more. A vertical, not asymptote, but tangent line. Those are the ones that are kind of tricky because it's smoothly connected, right? But it's a infinite slope. And those are important features of the graph. I guess for answering both those questions about F prime, we first need to find what? F prime. Well, we have F. Okay, let's do it. Um, what should we do first? Rewrite it, yeah. So F of X equals... I have x squared minus 1 squared, and then all of that is to the what power? To the 1 third. If I do it like that, if I leave it like that, how many layers do I have? I have, I have probably one more layer than I need, right? I have three layers there because I have blob to the 1 third, blob squared, and then the blob. So, yes, we can actually get rid of a layer, which means one link in the chain, simply by uh, combining those exponents, which is what I would highly recommend. And, of course, you could go straight from f of x to that. Now there's only two layers, right? Blob to the two-thirds and the blob. And any time you can get rid of one iteration on the derivative, make the, make the chain a little bit shorter, um, not so good for putting a dog at the end of the chain. You know, they like longer chains to run around on. But in terms of what we're doing, you know, fewer, fewer factors, fewer opportunities for careless mistakes. So simplify early and often. All right, here we go, f prime of x, working from the outside in. We get blob to the two-thirds, so it becomes two-thirds blob to the negative one-third, and we just rewrite the inside, times the derivative of x squared minus one, the chain rule, 2x. Nice. Now, we could walk away from that, but we have to use it. And so this is the whole reason why we practice simplifying. Uh, let's see, I got a 2x times 2, that could become a 4x when I combine this and that. And I know that my variable factor is a negative, so it's going to go to the bottom maybe with the 3 that's down there. 
and I could put it back under a cube root. So there's the nice cleaned up version of a derivative. Now it's going to be easier to plug in values and evaluate them, but we're going to do the opposite. We're going to do two things. So we're going to go off to the side and make sure that we show it carefully. The first one, I'm just going to say f prime equals zero. Now, believe it or not, if this were some free response, you might earn a check for that, or you might lose a check if you don't show that. It's important to show the equation you're solving. Now, because it's a fraction, a fraction is equal to zero when the what's equal to zero, the numerator. So that's when 4x equals zero. And of course, solving now, we get x equals zero. That's going to be the location of a horizontal tangent line. Anytime you have the slope equals zero, you get a horizontal tangent line. Now we'll do the other one. F prime of x is going to equal d and e. Ooh, when is this equation going to be d and e? When the denominator is zero. Good. So that's when 3 cube root of x squared minus 1 equals zero. Now, are we trying to avoid negatives under this radical? Because that could make the derivative undefined too. Or is it okay to have negatives under a cube root? Cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. Yeah, so it's good. We just don't want to divide by 0. Now, without showing any work, as long as you show that, you could go straight to your answer, or is it answers? What two values give you 0 when you plug them in for x? Just 1? There's also negative 1, yeah. So if you think that you're going to miss that, just do the algebra. Go ahead and divide by 3 and cube both sides. Divide by 3, you get 0. Cube both sides, you get 0. Cube is 0. You get x squared minus 1 equals 0. And then from there, there's two ways to solve it. You either extract the square roots, separate it. But remember that when you take the square root by solving, if you're introducing it, you have to consider plus or minus. So there you get the two roots. Or it's a difference of squares, which will kind of get you to uh, both factors as well. Well, three is I, I divided through by three. Yeah, you want to you have you want to have a full fledged syntax factored version of the derivative, but when you go off to the side to solve it, then it's just an equation. If you divide both sides by three, zero divided by three is zero. Yeah, and then I cubed both sides. That's how I got rid of the cube root. Okay, so um, at any rate, there's going to be two values where the derivative is d and e, and those could be. Uh, cusps, discontinuities, or vertical tangent lines. Now let's look at this. The derivative was undefined there. Is What's the domain of f? Let's just ask that question. What's the domain of our original function? We don't have to worry about negatives under the radical because cube roots and negatives are okay. We're trying to avoid division by zero then. Are we ever going to be dividing by zero in this problem? There is no denominator. So the domain is all real numbers. That's kind of important. So there's two values where the derivative doesn't exist, two values that aren't in the domain of the derivative function but are in the domain of the original function. So this, this is, these are going to be places where f is continuous but not what? Diffable. And this makes a really good multiple choice question, right? And it would be like one of those multiple multiple choice questions, like which of the following about f of x is true? f of x is continuous for all x, f of x is differentiable for all x, f is not differentiable, whatever, not continuous at any number of values. Well, would we have been on cusp alert in this type of problem? Yeah, once we simplified, we got that quantity to the positive 2 thirds power. Whenever you have a fractional exponent less than 1, you need to be on cusp alert because that is going to jump to the denominator when you take the derivative. And so the two values that make that zero, namely negative one and one, are now going to give you division by zero. So you could actually be on the lookout for places where the function is continuous but not differentiable without actually taking the derivative, just by knowing how they would be generated from the original function. Okay, I think, I think those, they, they do end up being either a cusp or a vertical tangent. You want to see what they are? Are you curious? I'm kind of curious at this point. We're going to have a whole unit later on on actually uh, sketching it. Let me get rid of these piecewise functions. Piecewise. 
All right, so um, I'm just going to type it in as x squared minus 1 to the 2 thirds power. A little bit easier. And you're not going to lose any information by doing that. Zoom 6. Nice, nice. It's blue. I like that. That's pretty cute, huh? Does that function have any symmetry? Yeah. What type of symmetry does it have? Y-axis symmetry? So it must be a what type of function? It's an even function. Yeah. So what did those uh, X values end up being? Cusps. They were both cusps. And that's important because notice they're not just cusps. They are what we're going to call local minimums, right? In this local vicinity, that y value at x equals negative 1 is a local y value or relative low y value. Same thing over here. So the place where the derivative is undefined are going to be potential local max or mins, which we'll call critical values here soon enough. And then notice at 0, we have the nice, smooth vertical turning around point. Um, we have a horizontal tangent, and that ended up being a local what? That y value there ended up being a local max. Yeah. So it turns out that the places where the function is defined, but either the derivative is not or is equal to zero, end up being very, very important values of x because they are potential local extrema, local max, local min. All right, cool. All right, example three, making good time. Find the domain of f of x. Does that require calculus? Nah. We're trying to avoid square roots, fourth roots, even roots of negatives. Do we have any radicals here with variables under them? I don't see any radicals, but radicals can come in disguise, right? How would you spot a radical in disguise? Fractional exponent. Well, 3 is fractional, but it's also an integer, so that's not going to be a problem. But we do also want to avoid division by 0. So for what value of x or what values of x, when I plug in there and cube it, give me a 0. 1 half? Yeah, it's going to be when 1 minus 2x is 0, which is at 1 half. Because 1 half times 2 is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. Is that the only value that gives us a problem? 1 half? Yeah, I believe, I believe so. And again, if you want to systematically do it, just say that the denominator can't equal zero, and you'll solve that like an equation. You get x can't equal one-half. So the domain of f is going to be the set of all x such that x is not equal to one-half. Just reviewing there, is that going to be a whole or a vertical asymptote or a jump or an oscillation discontinuity? Vertical asymptote, why? When you plug it in, you get non-zero over zero, or none of those cubic factors that cause zero or, or none of those factors that are cubed divide out. So there is a vertical asymptote at x equals 1 half. Is f going to be differentiable at 1 half? No way, no how. Since f of x is not continuous at 1 half, it's not going to be differentiable there. Show that the slope of every tangent line to the graph of f is positive. Show that the slope of every tangent line to the curve of f is positive. Well, let's talk about the consequence of that first. If the slope is always positive, then what can we say about the function? Yes, if f of x is positive, or I'm sorry, if the slope of f is positive, that is, if f prime of x is greater than 0 for all x in the domain, then f is going to be what we call monotonic increasing. Oops. Monotonic increasing. Or another way to say that monotonic increasing is strictly increasing. So how can we show that? Should we just graph it and then uh, draw arrows to the graph and say, look, monotonic increasing? How is the derivative going to help us with that? Well, I think I already said it, right? We, all we got to show is that the derivative is positive everywhere in the domain. So we need the derivative. Let's, let's come up here where we can see it. You want to use the Hody High rule? I don't either. I, I mentioned earlier that if you ever have a, a ratio and the numerator is a constant, 
it's probably easier to take the derivative by bringing it to the top and then using the good old what rule? Chain rule. So here we go. F prime of X is going to be negative 3 blob to the what power? Negative fourth power. Times the chain rule generates a negative 2X, which now I know I'm writing in Clemson colors, right? Yeah. Negative 2. Yeah, just a negative 2. Great. Not negative 2X. Careless mistakes. Easy to make. All right, so let's go ahead and simplify that. Negative 3 times negative 2 is 6. And then the other factor drops down to the bottom and becomes to the fourth power. Now, what do I know about that derivative? That's what it cleans up as. The top is always a positive 6, so therefore it's always positive. And the bottom is to the fourth power, so it should also be always what? Positive. So all you have to do then is say that this is greater than 0, but for what values of x? For all x except one half. And again, that inverted capital A means what? For all. And you're welcome to use it, otherwise write it out. If you didn't say for all x uh, not equal to one half, it's not, it's not true. Okay, so um, that's essentially the work that we would show down here on part B. And that, that's all you'd have to show. Is that, that right there? Now, we already said what conclusion can you draw about f from that? It's going to be monotonic increasing. Or strictly increasing, um, we should probably add something here, over its domain. Or it's strictly increasing, again, for all x not equal to one-half. Something to that effect. That's kind of good to know. Whatever the graph looks like, wherever it lives, it's going uphill from left to right. Nice little application of the chain rule. All right, least powers, you know how to do it. We did it in the warm-up. I'm going to let you do that on 4A. You're finding the derivative of y with respect to x, and then you're going to factor out the least powers afterwards and make it pretty. Okay? So I'm going to do it quietly up here so we can compare answers. Uh, you get your work, and we'll see how you did.
factoring out least power stage is probably the newest thing for y'all. That's the stage up here where there's brackets. Quickest, fastest, easiest, most fun way to put something with uh, ugly exponents back into a single factorable term that you can then use. That's us. Seniors, tomorrow we will take your senior class picture out on the front lawn. Oh. Uh, out there at eight forty-five if you want to be included in the picture. If you have first period off, you will need to remember to come to campus early. You will receive purchasing information after the picture is taken. Also, just a reminder: final voting for Key Homecoming King and Queen will end this Wednesday. The ballot can be found in the NDHS Student Information Course. Homecoming tickets will be on sale during lunches all week long, $10 each or $15 per couple in advance. Dress up days for this week are today, dress like you live in the Capitol, Maniac Monday. Tuesday is District Day. Wednesday is Warrior Wednesday, dress, dress like a ninja or your favorite superhero. Thursday is Survival Day, dress in camo. Friday will be ND District Day, dress in your blue and white. Candlelight Tech Rally will be held after the freshman game on Thursday. Students, this year we are rewarding students with perfect attendance. Today is going to be our first day. We put all students who had perfect attendance for six weeks in a drawing. The following students can come to the office at this time to pick up their prize. Uh, today we'll announce the sophomores, tomorrow we'll announce the juniors, and on Wednesday, uh, maybe Thursday, we'll announce the That would be ironic. Uh, he didn't come to school today for his perfect attendance award. He's at the dentist. Dylan Kinman, Patrick Kudelka, um, Andrew Lorena. I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing it's probably like a five dollar gift card to Church's Chicken or something. It's going to be really difficult to take attendance on Wednesday because there might be a few seniors that are at the dentist, and all the ones that are here are going to be dressed like ninjas. And I might just wow. That's right. Yeah, I counted them all absent. I didn't see any of them. Okay. So rewriting it, we have a product rule. Uh, rewriting that to the one half power. So it's a product rule first. Derivative of the first times the second in pink, plus the first times the derivative of the second in blue. Don't forget the chain rule generates that negative two x. The next line in, that goes from the color to the green. I'm just simplifying that second term. I've got an x squared times x, which is an x cubed. The negative I pulled out front, and a half times two makes it a one. And then I'm looking through for factoring out least powers. I have at least an x to the first because 1 is less than 3, uh, pull that out, and then my 1 minus x squared pieces, a negative 1 half is smaller than 1 half, so I factor it out. All right, then I put the beefy brackets in the first term. Of course, the 2 is still there. Um, the x is divided out because 1 minus 1 is 0, and then the exponent of the 1 minus x squared, again, is the 1 half minus the negative 1 half. What you started with minus what you factored out, that gives you a 1. And on the second one, of course, we're left with x squared, again, because 3 minus 1 is 2. But we don't really think about that when we factor an x out of an x cubed. It just happens naturally. And, of course, the whole piece is gone. From there, we go to simplifying. The x is to the first power, so it's in the numerator. The next factor is negative 1 half, so it jumps to the bottom under the radical. And then all i got to do is just expand out this thing in the brackets, and I get 2 minus 2 x squared minus x squared. Simplifying by combining those like terms, you end up with this in the end. Now, that is a very user-friendly format. 
is when I set the numerator equal to zero, I can get zero pretty quickly, and then maybe two others from this other factor. So those would be possible horizontal tangents, possible, uh, uh, they're going to be in the domain possibly. We didn't find the domain. And I can also tell where the derivative is undefined, which we were on cusp alert from the beginning, kind of, right? Because we had a, fra a fractional exponent of a half. And again, notice that piece jumped to the bottom. So if they were in the domain, namely one and negative one of the function, they are not going to be in the domain of the derivative because now they cause you division by zero. Pretty nifty, okay? Um, let's see. Let's finish up with this one. We'll do it together, and then uh, that will probably take us to uh, the bell. We got f of x is equal to that. Let's, let's look at the domain first. We should probably get in the habit now that we're thinking about using these for something. Think about the domain first. What values of x work in this function? All real numbers? Yeah, we spent a lot of time in pre-cal doing that. There is a radical and a denominator, but it's a cube root radical, so we don't really care about having negatives under there. And we're never going to divide by 0 because x squared plus 4 is 4 at the very least, only bigger, uh, if not 4. So we're never dividing by 0. We're never taking the cube root of a forbidden number. So the domain is all real numbers. If we're going to take the derivative of that, we could use the Hody high rule. Do you want to use the Hody high rule? You have the option. I am not. I am going to bring that to the top and call it to the negative one-third. Now, notice you're not really on cusp alert here because your exponent is already negative. You're bringing it already from the denominator. You could use the Hody high rule if you'd like. But I'm going to use the product rule here, and now I'm ready to go. F prime of x is 1 times x squared plus 4 to the negative one-third. So that's the derivative of the first times the second plus the first x times the chain rule, parentheses, negative one-third, x squared plus 4 to the negative four-thirds power. This right here, the exponent negative four-thirds, that's the number one mistake I see students make. That's a mistake that I would make probably, right? Forgetting to put the new exponent. So don't forget that. It's multiply, then subtract, and then times the chain rule, 2x. Now cleaning that up, uh, I'm not sure if you really need to do that. It looks like uh, the only common factor we're going to have is the x squared plus 4 piece. So I'll just factor it out first by rewriting it, and then uh, what exponent am I going to factor out? The smaller of the two, which would be negative 4 thirds. Again, I like the beefy brackets, but feel free to use wimpy parentheses if you don't want to be that forceful. They stand out a little bit more to me. What would be the new exponent in the first factor on the x squared plus 4? We're starting with a negative one-third exponent. We're factoring out the negative four-thirds, so you subtract, right, what you started with minus what you factored out. So negative one-third minus negative four-thirds is really plus four-thirds, right? So it's really four-thirds minus one-third, which is three-thirds, which is really one. There you go. Now, whenever you factor out least powers after you do the power rule, you should end up with nice exponents because the power rule generates them, and you're going to be off by one normally because that's what the power rule says, multiply and subtract one. There are exceptions, though. I wouldn't want to overgeneralize. And then in the next one, I'm going to have a negative two-thirds x squared, and that's it, right? Because the x squared plus four to the negative four-thirds is the only thing that came out. Now, to clean that up, um, notice what's in the brackets is the only thing that's going to be in the numerator, and there's really nothing to distribute. So I have a one x squared in the top. Here's where I could drop the parentheses. And again, let's just talk about that. Um, these parentheses are nice to have because they show the grouping of the x squared plus 4. But because there's nothing to distribute, they do kind of get in the way, right? So just imagine them not being there now, and now you can combine your like terms with your x squared. So 1 minus 2 thirds is 1 third. So you have 1 third x squared uh, plus 4. And then the bottom, that jumps down to the bottom, goes back under a cube root, x squared plus 4 to the fourth power. 
Now, that would be a perfectly acceptable cleaned up version of the derivative, but some people might prefer to still do what? Are you all okay with that one-third coefficient? If this were like a multiple choice question, probably would multiply by 3 over 3 and just call that x squared plus 12 all over 3 cube root of x squared plus 4 to the fourth. Just looks a little bit more user friendly. And again, make sure that when you're writing your division bars, Did I do that right? What's that? This x squared minus this two-thirds x squared. Right here, uh, see how I added this little piece on at the end? I know it's easy to, like, get to the end and then just have your division bar that you've already drawn and it's something extends. So just make sure everything covers what it's supposed to cover, radical bars included. Um, and there's a nice there's a nice cleaned up version of the derivative. Oh, is this function going to have any horizontal tangent lines? Will it have any horizontal tangent lines? Another way to ask that question is, will this numerator ever equal what? Zero. Will it? No. Mm -mm. So, pretty nice. All right, we'll stop right there for the day, and then tomorrow we'll look at some trig stuff. We should be able to finish tomorrow, so... Um, I guess the worksheet will be due on Thursday. Okay, we'll just make it due Thursday. Not Ninja Day. Yeah, you could do it at the dentist's office, right? Maybe talk to your dentist about um, about calculus. See if it's right for you.